Of all the characters that represent Halloween and horror in general, witches are some of the most unique characters in fiction. Looking at other iconic characters that show their heads come October... Wait a minute. I think I'm a bit late for that type of video. Change of plans! Witches come in all forms, nefarious and noble, conventional and contemporary, magical and metaphorical. So witches are some of the most versatile fictional characters that remain relevant all year round. Because of that, I'm going to take a look at the top 10 witches that appear across different forms of media. However, seeing how often they appear in media that is not seasonal, this is quite a broad topic that has a large pool of characters with different personalities and supernatural powers to choose from, so I'm going to get some help by summoning a real-life witch. That's right, with this book of magic spells I'm holding off screen that is definitely real and not a printed out word document that I typed up, let's do this. So say the magic words, hey, come over here. Those are strange words. Ta-da! What list is this? Whoa, that worked. I summoned a real witch. But I'm not a witch. W w what do you mean? You're clearly a witch. What are you doing? We're recording right now. It's just a skit. I will not sit for this. I'm out of here. Okay, uh, sorry there. I had to cut the recording for a second. I must have used the wrong spell. Now I summon the real witch. Isn't that right? Okay, yes. I'm totally a witch. Totally. So yeah, here are our top 10 witches. Number 10. Maple from Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Seasons, and Oracle of Ages. She's not the greatest video game witch of all time, but something about her says... interesting. Maybe it's the fact Legend of Zelda is a series that seems like it needs a traditional witch, or maybe it's her overuse of eyeshadow. She isn't really the most impactful character in the series, but what she does is invaluable to Link's journey. Well, maybe we should replace the term invaluable with unnecessary, but it's still charming. All she does is really crash into Link, causing them both to drop random items from their inventory. For Link, that's just his standard rupees and bombs, but for Maple, she has some rare items, like potions. Maple will then race you to pick up these items, so not only can you recover your own items as Link, but you can get some treasures as well by stealing them from Maple because you clearly know which yours in the pile of items. She also decides to mix it up with her transportation by ditching the broom for a vacuum cleaner. So hey, even though she's not the greatest, ain't she cute? She's acceptable. Only acceptable? Well, if you don't like her, we could always go to a similar witch in uh, Irene from Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds. Not happy enough, but I like her clogs. So, uh, back to Maple? Back to Maple. Number 9. The Three Witches from Macbeth. The main magic of the Three Witches, which is possibly just a metaphor, is fortune telling. They chant spells when they are seen using various body parts and a few other types of items to make their potion. What they lack in amazing magical abilities they make up for with iconic staples in the long line of cliches for witch characters. It's not cliché when they did it, though, because they were written in the 17th century. I mean, bubble, bubble, toil, and trouble? Do you see any other witches using the term toil if they never started the trend? Also, they were the first to use Eye of Newt in their magic cauldron, so they can wear their hipster glasses proudly with that one. Their impact on the story of Macbeth is pretty notable, despite their brief appearances. Though I am talking about one of the main Shakespeare plays that every high school literature class talks about at some point, so no one probably wants to hear a detailed analysis of that again. I will say that their questionable magic skills are balanced out by their ambiguity on if they actually predicted the future, or if they manipulated Macbeth into doing basically everything we saw him do in the play, headlined by his murder of King Duncan. Number 8. Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service this little witch stars in her own film. It's a Miyazaki movie, so you know it appeals to everyone. Kids, adults, it's the staple of some people's childhoods. It really is. And I have the VHS, and I can't play it because I don't have a VCR anymore. While I can very much respect her personality and her story, her powers are pretty limited. Why should we include her over characters with plenty more powers we excluded from this list? Because she has to live in the human world and get experience in order to become a witch. Oh, okay, so I get it. 
She's here because of the witch she can become, not because the witch she is currently, and because Kiki's delivery service is a classic. But does she really deserve to be on this list? She loses her powers in the middle of the movie. What does she have that's truly unique? Well, she can fly. If you look on the cover of the movie, she's riding a broom. Can you ride a broom? I don't think so. But, but, but I'm not eligible for this list. How is that even rel- You know what, it's fine. Kiki actually does deserve to be here. Number 7. Willow from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This series has the modern interpretation of all the fantasy elements, making Willow the modern day witch. While she is a hero for most of the series, we do see she has a tragic, villainous, anti-hero side. She does. Willow has a girlfriend, and when Willow's girlfriend died, Willow became Dark Willow and she went crazy! In this form, she displays various new powers many of which she could not use when she was in her, well, not dark form. However, one thing that also changes is her appearance. And to be honest, it's kinda creepy. Her eyes went black, and things just started to blow up. They blew up everywhere. Number six, Robin from Witch Hunter Robin. Now, I actually haven't seen this anime. If only there was someone here who suggested this for number six that could give me a rapid-fire explanation of who she is. Pick me! Pick me! Go. Say it. Okay, okay, so here's how it goes. Robin used to be a nun, so she's an ex-nun. And then she joins this secret organization to hunt witches, but she's a witch. Secret spoiler! I hope I didn't ruin that for you. So then she hunts witches. And her secret power is she can light things on fire, but she has really bad eyesight. And the way that she lights things on fire is that she looks at them, and then with her eyes, she lights them on fire, but she has really bad eyesight. So she has to get glasses so that she can light things on fire properly, and that she doesn't light the wrong thing on fire properly. Oh my god! Number five, Ellis from El Cazador de la Bruja. She's from a series that has very good episodic plot lines, but the overarching plot involving Ellis and the witches gets kind of confusing. The witches in El Cazador are an endangered race of magic users who live in a secret society. Ellis is an artificial witch created in a laboratory to help keep the race alive in an effort by a group of scientists. However, the surviving witches don't like that witches are being created synthetically, so that starts a bounty hunter trapezoid, if you will, of people who are either trying to save or kill Ellis. Since I don't want to turn this entry into a full review of the show, that's enough of the main plot. Ellis has a limited set of powers, since most of what she can do is out of her control and dormant when she's not under pressure. It's the scenario of her being unaware of her powers until a later point in the series. Her main sorcery involves her changing the temperature of things, which is a very versatile power. This has resulted in her saving her travel companion Nadia and Alice herself. Numerous different results have occurred from this. She has lit things on fire, created ice on pathways, made an enemy's gun too hot to hold, and even melted a bounty hunter's shoe. It's more helpful than it sounds. She has also been seen levitating, or just jumping really high, it's ambiguous, and she can even remove items like bullets from the human body, which may relate to her temperature control. Her ultimate power, which is revealed at the end of the series, is the motivation of the series' antagonists. That being said, she becomes a well-fleshed-out character as the series progresses, and we get a chance to learn more about her besides her powers. Alice's hobbies include blowing bubbles, going to souvenir shops, and being bluntly honest. Being bluntly honest isn't really a hobby, it's more just who she is. Ellis was isolated as a child, which is why she's so naive. She'll always tell the truth, along with being very loyal to whoever she's with, and it causes some comedic moments because she interprets things literally. Like if you say something's viral, like a video going viral, she'll think it's just covered in germs. So you can either have a shameless laugh or roll your eyes. I had a shameless laugh. Number 4, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty and other Disney films, like Maleficent with Angelina Jolie. She is one of the most evil Disney villains in all of Disney's history. She has many different powers, but what's her most famous power? Well, that's up for you to decide. 
Well, Maleficent could turn to a huge dragon, which isn't really that evil, but she's really powerful in that form, and then she can kill a lot of people and breathe fire, which isn't so good. So I guess that's really bad. Whoa, 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 hold up. Disney actually officially classifies Maleficent as an evil fairy, and they clearly classify other characters as witches, so I don't think evil fairy and witch are synonymous. Well, that's not my fault. I didn't classify her as evil fairy. We can replace Maleficent in this spot with another Disney villain. We are talking about a company that makes movies about fairy tales for a living. They have copious amounts of witches in their famous movies to replace Maleficent. What about Snow White? The villain in that cast a spell to make the poison apple. That being said, her name was just the evil queen rather than the evil witch, so maybe she's just a vain queen that only cast two spells throughout the movie. Not the best resume. No, stay with the dragon. I like the dragon. Uh, how about Madame Mim from Sword in the Stone? A forgotten classic. She can transform. She can even turn into a dragon. A less intimidating one. Or how about Mother Gothel from Tangled for a contemporary choice? She uses magic and she's a witch, although she just uses her magic just to keep her youthful appearance, so maybe we should just stick with Maleficent. I think you answered your own question. Number three, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Now many people know her through the 90s and 2000s live action sitcom, but she actually got her start in the 1970s in Archie Comics. The premise was Sabrina was a teenager whose father was a witch and mother was a human, meaning Sabrina was a half-witch whose powers awaken on her 16th birthday. She lives with her two aunts, who are full-blooded witches and their cat Salem, who used to be a human witch that was turned into a cat as punishment for trying to conquer the world enforced by the Witches' Council, who set the rules for the witch community. The plotlines of Sabrina involve her learning more about her magical abilities or using magic in her life with some consequences, since there wouldn't be a plot if nothing went wrong in that scenario. She actually had a series in the 1970s that followed that formula with some cartoon antics. However, the Sabrina most people know, including me, was from the ABC series in the TGIF lineup, meaning it was fun and appropriate for the whole family. This series did a great job of bringing these plots to a live-action setting and bringing reality into the mix, making the scenarios with magic gone wrong even funnier. The live-action series did a good job staying alive when it changed networks to the WB and had Sabrina move on to college since they already did four seasons of high school. It changed about half the cast too, but it brought on new personalities so the remaining characters had new banter options. At this point when the show was promoted on the WB, they called it Sabrina Goes to College since she really wasn't a teenager anymore. But for legal reasons, the series still had to be named Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Despite that lie the title of the show eventually told me, I'll still call it the second best series with a witch in a sitcom setting. Speaking of, number two, Samantha from Bewitched. Samantha is the original modern witch of the 20th century. Her powers aren't the most innovative of what we've seen from other witches on this list, but she's a pioneer in terms of the modern witch. Mainly we see her control objects from a distance, freeze time or just people in place, and teleporting. Samantha uses these examples of magic in her everyday life by famously wiggling her nose. Sometimes her more extreme uses of magic can lead to problematic yet comedic scenarios that are generally resolved in the duration of a 30 minute episode. That being said, most of the magic on A-Wire plotlines are usually caused by her mother and Dora, or other members of her witch family. Inconveniencing the common man! Yeah, every time a spell goes wrong, the recipient of it is usually Darren, Samantha's husband. And in basically every plot where this happens, Darren really doesn't do that much wrong to deserve it. There was also a plotline about how Samantha was appointed to become the Queen of the Witches in Season 4, so maybe all that focus earlier on her abilities at face value is overrated. It's time for number one. You might think of her as a conventional choice for number one. When you think of a generic witch, her image should come to mind. Number one, the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. Everywhere, the standard witch has staples of her appearance. She created them. The green skin, the hat, the black robe, flying on a broom. She can teleport. She sees you when you're sleeping. She knows when you're awake. 
Quite frankly, you do not want her as your enemy since she has the tools to plan ahead. When we don't see her using her magical abilities, we see her summoning minions. Many, many minions. Of course, just as iconic as the swarms of minions she summons is her endgame weakness. Her main weakness is water. That's not even a weakness, it's just instant death for her. The fact that she is supposedly one of the most dangerous beings in Oz considering how much everyone fears her, all they had to do was just get a few drops of water on her and their problems would have been solved. Is she that hard to get near? Is water a sparse commodity in the land of Oz? Why was there just a bucket of water sitting there anyway? I guess the witch didn't have enough foresight to check for water when she was spying on the crew. It was partially her fault when she was killed since she was threatening them with fire. Did you not expect somebody to retaliate with a liquid that extinguishes fire? Still, even with that weakness, she formed what other witches were based off of, and in a way, that's more meaningful than just awesome powers and such. And really, that's just what the movie showed. The Wizard of Oz has an extended universe showing the Wicked Witch is much more of a personality than your standard evil villain that just wants ultimate power. Haven't you seen Wicked? Well, actually, I haven't. Well, you should, because it will completely change your perspective on witches. It's not what you think. It's not what you think at all! So those are just some of the reasons why the Wicked Witch of the West is our number one. Thank you all for watching, and thanks for joining me, Witch I Summoned. A witch? Where? <sighs> not this again. Anyway, agree? Disagree? Are there any witches that we did not put on the list that you think should have been here? Please, let us know. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you in the next video.